realized I was like a rat in the credit card company maze, and I was doing exactly what they wanted me to do. I was a huge saver my whole life. I'd save 60% of my salary and just invest it, invest it, invest it. I lived way below my means. Many people called me cheap or thrifty or frugal or whatever they wanted to say that wasn't as offensive. The idea of spending someone else's money is so attractive. No one ever tells me, man, the credit card is really what, that, that was my ticket to freedom. And so that's what I found is that you need to introduce some pain and friction into your life if you want to win with money. You can't have this frictionless system, and that's what credit cards have mastered with their marketing. Okay, you're going to do take off. Murray County Thank traffic, you. TBM 975, Charlie Alpha, taking runway 6 for departure, Murray County. Uh, just kind of check and make sure the area is clear. So hold it like right about there. So if you hold it there, that's about uh, what you see for level flight. And so I'm going to run the power up. I'll check the instruments, and you just hold it right there. Just keep it right here. Yeah, for now. As and we I, gain speed. I'm, I'm watching the airspeed, yep. So we got 50. And my, I'm, keep, I'm keeping the, the nose centered with the pedals. There's 60 knots, 100% torque. Everything looks good. We're in the green. There's 85 knots. Slowly pull back a little bit. Just pull back. Yeah, just hold it right there. And this thing will just fly itself. So that's a little bit too much. You see okay. a lot of sky. Oh, so yeah. just push it a little forward. All right. There you go. You're flying. And try to just keep looking around. So it, try not to get fixated on one thing. That's what oh, yeah. pilots do a lot of times. So keep your scan moving. If you can do that, it helps. There we go. And a little bit more forward. I'm going to put the flaps up. I just want a little bit more speed. There we go. Flaps are up. So if you too much forward, we're going to crash into the ground. Do you feel that? Like you're oh, seeing yeah. a lot of ground. So yeah. that's me on the stick. I'm just kind of point it back a little bit. And uh, how was that? Easy to take yeah. off, right? I mean, I feel like I, I, I wasn't really the mastermind behind the takeoff, but I felt good. Well, I mean, talking through it, you were actually doing it. I was just telling you what to do. Oh, I, I, I thought you were a uh, man of the controls. Oh, uh, if, if you felt anything on the controls, it was probably, uh, so we trimmed the airplane up. It could have been you, like the trim fighting oh, you a little bit. Oh, yeah. So as we change. I felt the weight. Yeah, the weight is, uh, is built in to try to get you some. Uh, some forces on the controls. On a commercial plane, is it pretty much autopilot once they take off? Like, uh, Yeah, we could go to autopilot right now and it'll fly itself. But, I mean, still, the pilot in the loop is really important. You know, you, oh. the, the autopilot could fly into the ground, too, if it's messed up. All right, uh, who are you and what are you doing in my airplane? That's a great question. I feel humbled to even be here. But my name is George Camel. I'm a Ramsey personality. Been on the Ramsey Solutions team. Dave Ramsey, of course, for 11 years now. And so, start as an intern followed the money plan. It changed my life. I started broke as a $40,000 $40, in debt at 23 years old. Now over a million dollar net worth 10 years later following the Ramsey plan and getting to teach people this stuff. Wow. I bet the people hope. that know me and follow me for a long time are probably shocked that we're sitting next to each other without like, knives and guns. This is like guns. dinner with the enemy right now, you know? <laughs> But I love a good plane ride, and Bill's a super nice guy, and I, I can get along with a wall. And so I really have very few enemies out there unless they really just want to hate. Yeah, I'm the same way. Uh, and it's, you know, it's kind of all in fun and a joke. But um, I, I'm, I'm interested to, to understand a little bit more of that, about that. How do you be, start from an intern, and now, like, I understand you're, like, doing the podcast, you're, like, all over, you have a huge social media platform. Um, what, how do you do that? Oh, man. Well, you know, it's hard to take credit when Dave has built this amazing platform for 30 years, and I get the advantage of that. So I, I feel like a turtle on a fence post in a sense of, like, someone put you there. You know, it didn't get there by herself, but I did work my tail off from intern to full-time employee, doing email marketing into a social media role at Ramsey, and eventually wiggled my way on with an on-stage role and on-camera role as a MC and host. And so really what that took was taking any opportunity in front of me and that opportunity was hosting Battle of the Bands. You know, at a company event we did, I was a musician, so I'd be in the bands, and I went, I could do better on the hosting side than in the musician side. And so I raised my hand to host. They let me do it. They saw some talent there and went, hey, this guy loves Ramsey. He follows the plan. He's great on stage. Let's give him a shot as a host. And so with every little bit of rope, I just really was trying to be faithful and excel in that. And that turned into a little more rope, a little more rope. And all of a sudden, they sort of looked up and went, this guy's kind of teaching our stuff and creating new content around our principles. Let's give him a shot to sort of help carry the torch from Dave with the succession plan. That's awesome. I think a lot of people, they want to be the, the they want to get big really fast. And they're not oh, willing yeah. to do the work and put in the time like you did. Um, it just, it sounds like you just said yes to everything that was in front of you. 
it's really cool. Like, uh, and, and probably had the drive and just wanting more and more and more all the time. And you, somebody identified the fact that you were really good at what you did. Yes, and that, that is on good leadership. I found that every opportunity I've gotten in my career, it was a mix. It wasn't luck. It wasn't just hard work. It took someone else to notice and someone else to give me that opportunity. And that, to me, is great leadership. And so to have that at Ramsey has been incredible, and it's why I've been here 11 years, and I've had six jobs. Uh, most people my age, they're job hopping, they're trying to get to the next buck, they're trying to get to the next rung on the ladder, but I found that there's a beauty in just being faithful where you are at the same place, and the trust, the relationships, and the momentum I've been able to build at Ramsey, I think that's really what has caused me to be in this position today. Yeah, I love that. I agree. I mean, 20 years in the military, there were so many people along the way that saw potential in me, and they pulled it out of me. And yeah, I, I did some of the work, but without them, yeah, you know, my career could have gone a totally different direction in many yeah. ways. And being a test pilot, there was one test pilot in my squadron who was like the best pilot in the squadron. He, he, had a, he was kind of cocky, like kind of uh, loud mouth guy. He'll probably watch this and he'll know it's him. Yes. Uh, but he was the, he was the best stick uh, out there. Like he, he hit the numbers, and so I saw that, and I was like, that's elite status. I want to figure out how to be elite. And so it was just really cool. He, he poured into me, and then I kind of followed the same track that he, that he went. Went to test yeah. pod school in England, came back to the squadron for a few years. And it was all, a lot of the people that were in my life that, same thing with real estate. I experienced people that were making millions of dollars in real estate. I didn't even think it was ever possible. Like $150,000 a year was my cap my whole yeah. life. Like my, my dad made that. They were like, son, if you get a good job as an engineer, you make $150,000 a year. You'll be a millionaire by the time you're 70. And I was like, okay, that's great. I just never knew. So yeah. these people get put in our lives, and then our decision whether we want to kind of follow them or not. They open up some really cool doors. For sure. That's huge. Well, let's talk about some of the strategy and some of the things that you guys teach and maybe some of the stuff that, um, that I don't necessarily either subscribe to or do myself. I'd really love to start with credit cards because I've heard Ooh. you talk about this. And, um, and I think they're deadly, and there's a possible benefit to them, too. So I'd love to hear some of your philosophy on credit cards and just kind of see where it takes us. Absolutely. So I was that guy. I, you know, I built, I, getting into college, I was like, well, you have to get a credit card now. You've got to build your credit score. You've got to build your financial life. So I played that game. I had my Amex Sky Miles card, my Discover Cash back. I realized I was like a rat in the credit card company maze, and I was doing exactly what they wanted me to do. I was like, oh, I'm going to go spend at the restaurants because I got 5% on this card this month. I'm going to get some Sky Miles, and I'm going to get a free trip at the end of the year. And at the end of the day, I was $4,000 in debt, spending on random crap because that's the American way. And once I followed the Ramsey plan, I cut up the credit cards, got out of that debt. I realized that my debit card does everything the credit card allowed me to do just without going into debt. And I realized once I dropped my credit score, it's really only good to acquire more debt. And once I decided, and this is the, the really intense principle of I'm not going to do debt anymore, I, I really didn't need it anymore, and I've not found it to be a blessing for me or for the people that I encounter. No one ever tells me, man, the credit card is really what, that, that was my ticket to freedom. And that's what we all want. We want freedom, options, peace, and credit cards are a bad tool to get you there. What do you think it is about the credit card that, that does it, like that, that really kind of sucks you in? Uh, I think it's the marketing. Uh, the idea of spending someone else's money is so attractive. And when I don't have to pay for it up front, psychologically and emotionally, it feels better. It hurts. When you, when you spend $100 at the grocery store with cash, it is so painful. When you just swipe that card and then you take the card back and you get all your stuff, and you don't even pay for it in that moment, it feels wonderful temporarily until you get that bill at the end of the month. And so... The debit card obviously is this in-between where you don't feel it as much as cash, but it also comes out of my account. I see the transaction hit my phone immediately that that just came out of my account. And so that's what I found is that you need to introduce some pain and friction into your life if you want to win with money. You can't have this frictionless system, and that's what credit cards have mastered with their marketing. So are you saying that it's likely that somebody spends more money with a credit card than they would... So what's the hierarchy? Is it like cash, then debit card, then credit card psychologically? Yes. Yeah, and the, all the studies show that. I mean, MIT, they did a study with fMRI technology of the brain at the point of swiping that credit card, and they found that there's a twofold thing. It lets your foot off the brake when it comes to spending, and it hits the accelerator on spending at the same time. And so there's a twofold process where they found when it hurts less, it costs you more because people are willing to add more to the card. We've seen this with buy now, pay later. It's a similar thing where... Instead of 100 bucks now, I can spend 25 bucks now and put the rest on payments. Well, you end up adding more to the card by doing that. 
And so it's just a very consumer mindset, and credit card companies have mastered this. And it's one of the reasons we are now in record credit card debt in America. Uh, and most people say, well, just don't go into debt. Well, that's a very sweet thing, but the fall of man happened long ago, and we can't control that. And so the best thing I can do is get rid of the thing causing me to go into debt. And it's largely humans. It's the credit card is the tool. It's the humans that are the problem. Uh, I'm trying to think back to my, like my journey with money. Um, what would you say to the people who are like, well, I love the points, I'm going to pay off my credit card every single month, and I get cash back, so I, I got the one up on the credit card company because they're giving me free money. Oh, they love they love when, they, when the consumer thinks they're beating the system yeah. as they cash in. And so what I found as I did research, I, I did a book called Breaking Free from Broke that launched in January of 2024, and I did an entire chapter on credit cards, and I covered eight archetypes. And I, this one I call the rewards redeemer. They love the points. They can't get away from it. They get their free flights. They feel like they're winning because they got the cash back. And at the end of the day, the credit card companies are so smart. And I interviewed an ex-Capital One manager who told me they run tens of, tens of thousands of experiments on consumers every year. And that's why they switch from cash back to points. We don't know what 100,000 points is. We don't know what 50,000 miles is. It's not 50,000 miles of air travel. You know that. It's, well, 50,000 miles is really like a one-way flight that would have cost you 500 bucks. Yep. And so at the end of the day, they want to confuse the consumer into think they're winning. It's like Chuck E. Cheese. You go in there, you spend 10 bucks to get a bunch of tickets, you get a 1,000 tickets, and you realize I can get a $4 sticky hand. Yeah, that cost them probably 20 cents. Exactly. And yeah. so, but you think at the end of the day, oh my gosh, look at my prize. And Chuck E. Cheese is over there smiling big along with Amex and Capital One. There's a reason Capital One is sponsoring the Taylor Swift tour, and you can't afford tickets to the Taylor Swift tour. Yeah. And so these companies are winning, whether you like it or not. You know, uh, so I, I'm that guy. What did you call me? What is it? Rewards Redeemer. I'm the Rewards Redeemer. Love so, um, so for for my whole my whole life, I've been using credit card and paying it off in full every single month. However, about four months ago, I missed a deadline by oh. a day, and I had a pretty big balance. I carry like we spend a lot. Uh, my family. Yeah. It's it's a lot. But I'm at a point. So what I did was I was. I was a huge saver my whole life. I'd save 60% of my salary and just invest it, invest it, invest it. Like, I, I lived way below my means. Many people called me cheap or thrifty or frugal or whatever they wanted to say that wasn't as offensive. But I wouldn't go out. I was very much the millionaire next door. I read that yes. book, and that was me and because that was my dad. And I missed this payment, and it was like a $1,800 interest charge. Oh, my gosh. Just because I, like I have the money. I yeah. just missed it. But it hurts emotionally. And, oh, I'm like, I cannot believe that I just gave this Capital One company $1,800 because and paid it a day later. I just, because like, I have it on auto pay, but the problem was I didn't have enough money in that account. When it drafted it, it spit it back in the next oh. day. And I have so much money that moves around, I just missed it. And $1,800. And that pretty much negated probably all my rewards for the whole year on that card. Now, if I go back like the last 25 years, I, I probably have them. But I'm also, the way I'm getting paid is through their, their fees and somebody else getting screwed over. So oh, I'm yeah. getting the point. So how do you feel about that? Like, we've become a society of the people who can play the game really well, the rewards redeemer, are probably getting paid their money, not by Capital One, but by the person who can't manage their money no. properly. And that, that's something I looked into for the book because I was very curious. It wasn't me trying to moralize this and say that you're a bad person for getting the rewards, but it was frustrating because everyone said, well, I'm just getting the rewards from the transaction fees for, that they charge to businesses, not from people paying interest. So I looked into it, and I actually looked at Capital One's earnings report, and I found out that 75% of their credit card revenue came from interest and fees. Not from the business transactions. That made up about 20% of their credit card revenue. Which, by the way, if you're a small business owner, you should hate credit cards because they're charging you. Amex is charging you 3.5% for that transaction yep. when that person swipes their card. You know how that affects a small business owner out there? And so it, someone's getting screwed either way, either the business owner or the consumer paying the interest. But we can't act like this is totally free money coming from thin air out of the, the blessings from the credit card company. Oh. They exist to make money. And so uh, the Fed did a study. $15 billion moves every year from the poor, the uneducated uh, minority areas to the higher educated wealthy. So regardless of your opinion, again, this is a Fed study. This is not my opinion. 
it's hard to grapple with that as someone who, you know, has a pulse and a heart to go, ugh, that kind of feels gross that this is how I'm getting my reward. So I think for those that are on the fence, that argument is pretty is a pretty good way to sway you over to trying the debit card life. Uh, but for those that, you know, they'll find a different justification for their rewards because it feels good and they feel like they're winning. But I feel like that chapter in, the, in my book, Breaking Free from Broke, the credit card chapter, I've had so many people reach out and say, you actually convinced me to cut up my cards. You actually convinced me that this system is so broken and so toxic that I want no part in it. So that's been an honor to even, you know, convince someone of that. Because that's something that's so ingrained in our culture. I've never really thought about it that way, like the moral obligation that we have to society as well. Like, I, I take that... Uh, a really big responsibility for a lot of that in impacting and helping. And just the fact that, like, in preparation for this interview, I looked at how much we spent as a family on my Capital One card last yeah. year, and it was over $200,000 on wow. a card in one year. Now, keep in mind, for if you're watching this, I could have never even fathomed that in my 20s or when I was, You're you know, unbelievably blessed. Yeah. I mean, we're at a point right now where we put, like, vacations and trips and, and some of the business things. I started a new business, so I had to put a little bit on my personal card before that business was – I was funding the business a little bit. But, I mean, even $50,000 back in the day when I was – you know, it was – it's it's definitely more. Like, I have – I totally agree with you. We spend more because it's on the credit card because it feels like paper money. It's play money. If that was coming out of my bank account every single month, which it is, but I'm pre prepared for it, sure. but it's like HELOC management and all the stuff that I do, I would be like, wait, you want my wife, you want how much to go to the exactly. store? You want $5,000? That's my challenge right. to you. I wonder if for just six months you switch to only using a debit card or even at that, let's take that year, 200 grand in a year, I bet that you would have spent 150 grand if it was just a debit card because you would have felt the pain more, which means you got 50,000 in savings as a reward to yourself. And that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother investment into apartment building. I could put $50,000 into apartment building exactly. and double that money in five years. And uh, believe me, I totally agree with you. Like, it's, yeah, I, I don't think it's like a moral, like you're a bad person. For you, I think because of how smart you are and how diligent you are, you could just simply do better. And so, again, is it really worth the few thousand bucks in rewards you got when you could have mentally sort of had the discipline to spend less? And still had a great life, still enjoyed. It's not like you're not going on vacations anymore, but you just be more thoughtful and intentional with each purchase and each swipe. It's definitely a dangerous game, and they definitely have us in their maze like you talked about, because I, I know for sure, 100%, we wouldn't have spent that much money. But when I look at it, I'm like, okay, like maybe save 15, 20K, and the convenience of it is, is higher. It's just all this kind of stuff that's in my head, and I've been doing it my whole life. And now that... 18, that still stings, that $1,800 oh. finance charge. I'm like, because they don't charge, they charge on everything on oh, yeah. there. So, like, it's, oh, Back drives charge, me nuts. the interest, 22%. Like, finally got me, you know, and, and it drives me you are, nuts. like, the point zero one percent with how successful you are, your income. Most people calling into the show, they have 50000 in credit card debt, 100000 in credit card debt, and they make $60,000. Yep. And so the numbers, the math ain't mathin' with most of America. And so the problem is you have people who are very successful telling everyone credit cards are the answer who don't have the same problems as you and they have very different incomes. And that's where people get into troubles. They think I'm going to be the different one. I'm a credit card person. And so that's my big stink with credit cards. And I found as someone personally who ditched it, it's just a better, simpler, more peaceful life. And they're also definitely preying on the youth. Oh, and yeah. so, like, when I was a kid at college, so just like you talked about, they, they're set up everywhere. You get Give me a, the free T-shirt, five hundred. Yeah, that, that was it. It was the T-shirt, it was the reward or whatever, and it was a $500 limit card. And t then to think, like, oh, you, it, drug. it's how you build your credit, too. So it was all, like, this kind of talk. And then there was no possibility that I should have $500 when I was in that state oh, in college. Yeah. Like, I just that spent like that on beer and whatever, like, a college right kid. away. Yeah. And yet, they went to 100000 in student loan debt for some right. degree, even yeah. though they've never seen $500 in real life. Yeah, oh, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't even know if I want to go there next. Student loans is even worse. So. And I think it's all tied together. And I think credit cards truly are the gateway drug where if you get used to one payment in your life, we can get them used to another payment and another payment. And now we have a car payment over here. We got the student loan payment, the credit card payment. And then as you get older, it's the HELOCs and the mortgage. And all of a sudden, you wake up and go, Oh, inflation. The president needs to do something about this, the economy. And then I say, hey, what are your debt payments every month? They go, well, if you add it all up, it's about $4,000. And I'm going, and you think your income is the problem? It's your debt, man. Because no amount of money is going to feel like enough if you've got debt payments up to your eyeballs.
So what's the way to get out of debt? So people that are in a consumer debt like that, they have $4,000 a month in payment. They probably have credit cards. They probably have a car payment. They might have a mortgage. Like, what is the, how do you guys teach them to then get out of debt from first step? What's the first step? First step is to actually pay attention. Most people don't even really know how much debt they have, what the interest rates are, what the minimum payments are. They're just sloppy when it comes to money. And that's where making a budget is so important. A budget is not for broke people. It's not for wealthy people. It's for people who want to win with money. So we created a great app called Every Dollar. You can download it for free and use it and just make a plan. Go, here's my income for the month. Here's my take-home pay. Here's what ends up in my bank. And here's all of my expenses, including minimum payments on my debt. And with every dollar, it will lay it out from smallest to largest balance. Now, that part trips up people because they want to do math all of a sudden and go, well, actually, the high interest rate should be paid off first. And I'm like, why are you all of a sudden getting mathematical on me? You wouldn't be in debt if you understood good math when it came to consumer debt. And so the debt snowball is the method that we've taught for 30 years. It still works today. And it's list your debt smallest to largest, attack the smallest one with a vengeance while making minimum payments on the rest. So that might be 500 bucks extra, 1000 bucks extra, whatever you can muster up through selling stuff, side jobs, slashing your budget down to nothing. That's a short-term sacrifice to get out of debt. Because once you get out of that, that first small debt, you free up a payment. Now you can apply that payment plus all the margin to the next debt. And you can see how the snowball starts to pick up snow as it moves down that hill. And that's how we've found people get out of debt in, on average, 18 to 24 months. Is that is the, the smallest debt to give them like a, a win early on to feel like, okay, I, I can do this, as opposed to, I would think I would teach the highest interest, like you said, because that's the one that's the highest payment. So if I knock that out first, I actually have more in my pocket. But is, it, is the reason because the wins that they get faster makes them more likely to keep going? Yes, it's all about psychology. Yeah. We found that you know, winning with money and personal finance, it's 80% behavior, it's 20% head knowledge. And so we found over time, along with you know, Time Magazine, Harvard Business, they all researched Dave's method and went, the debt snowball actually is the best way to get out of debt. Because you've got to realize that you know, getting into debt was really easy and getting out is hard. And that takes emotion, it takes sacrifice, and it's more brain power and uh, you know, physical action than it is just mathematics. No, I when I look at like losing weight or you know getting into real estate, so I teach people how to like flip houses and wholesale houses and make money in real estate. And I find that from zero to one in real estate, that's the that's the difference. It's the belief. If I can get them to believe that they can do it, they'll do it exactly. and they'll stick with it. People fall off the wagon when they try to hit the highest interest rate first because it's it's just too difficult to start with the mountain. We need to have that kind of baby step into it. And so that's the way I've seen it work. I just We haven't seen a lot of people come to us and say, the debt avalanche was my savior. I paid off the highest interest first, and here I am. It, even the, and mathematically, it's probably a wash. Like Mathematically, there's not much of a difference because of how intensely you're attacking the debt. The interest is really not a huge factor at that point. Yeah. All right, you want to have a little fun? We'll feel, feel what a couple Gs feels yeah, like. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, Dylan, is that a, does that sound good to you? Okay. Uh, All right, I'll prepare my heart. If I pass out... Uh, I don't know what you know what to do. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I'm a pilot. Oh, boy. Uh, Dylan, you're I, my man. I can get you on the ground. Resuscitate quick. me. He'll videotape it, and I'll fly. What does it actually take to create a, a G-force? So a G-force is the force of gravity on you. So like you, when you're walking around on the planet, you're just at 1G, normal. Okay. So what it takes is it takes some sort of like downward force, so like a, a vector of some sort, whether it's typically like acceleration vector. So what in the airplane, what I need to do, is I need, to, I need to turn us to a point where we maintain level flight and I put some downward force on the plane. So we're feeling more force going down on our body towards the Earth's surface to get those Gs. So like, if I wanted to pull like, we could probably pull like five or six Gs. I'm not allowed to pull that many in this plane. Sure. But if I nose down and then I just pulled back like we were doing oh. a loop, right then we would get all this downward force on our body because the airplane is really accelerating up. But th th basically, so when we do, when we like, go do the hook, the hick maneuver so we go uh, we like you clench your legs you like tighten up all the muscles in your legs and your you're not going to have to do this today we're not two g's is like oh i can kind of feel it uh, but you're doing a lot of g's you'll you'll get your body like tense your abs and your legs and your and your arms and then you'll go hick, 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 and you're closing this glottis and just pushing all like keeping all the blood where it is fighting against the g yeah you're trying not to get the like your blood and to to go back down to your feet Wow. And away from your head. So um, that's it. We, it's not going to be that intense today. But what we'll do, I'll do like a 45 degree angle of bank turn, and then I'll maintain level flight, and that'll give us like one and a half Gs. And I'll probably go to like 60 and maybe a little bit more to, to give us like two Gs. So okay. you'll kind of feel it as I turn. So pretty simple. But 
Um, right here, let's see, there's uh, 45. So this is like a steep turn that I would do with people. Oh, yeah. So that's like that. just a little bit of G right there. Yeah. And now if I, uh, let me see, I'm going to kind of give us a little descent. I'll give us 60, and then I'll pull back for you there. So oh, that's like, yeah. that's probably like 1.8. Pretty, wow. pretty simple. Uh, that's wild. And then if I'm we... I'm thinking like triple that, you know, when you oh. get like a six. Well, at what point does your face melt off? Like, I, I, that's that like probably seven, like... Eight? Like when that's happening, you don't even know it's happening unless there's a camera on you. So it's, yeah, it's probably like six or seven. Eight for sure. Not so quite that, top So then this level. is... This is... No. Um, I'm just kind of coming down a little bit and I'll show you like a little bit on a pole here. Pole. So that's where oh. you can feel it a little bit more. Yeah. And then I'll just kind of level it out there a little bit. Oh. Holy crap, that's <laughs> fun. You just created a little mini roller coaster. That's right. It's like a little coaster. So, the kids love that. Kids, uh, it depends. My wife hates it. Absolutely oh, hates no. it. So she's usually on the plane when I have the kids. So it's pretty rare that I'll do it. Is there a, is there a like school driving, that so. people go to to learn pilot talk? Because I feel like all pilots have the same cool like voice vibe. <laughs> they teach you that. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, it, it's just relaxed, like real cool. Like uh, we're, we're just at about uh, 4,000 feet. They're climbing up to 31,000 feet. We're going to put the seatbelt sign on. And, yeah. Um, yeah what, I remember when I was just getting started to fly, my instructor told me, uh, his, his name was Iggy Valdez. He was my on-wing. And it's the it's first guy you fly with. You, I fly like, of the first 12 flights before you go solo, you fly like nine of them together. And you do ground school and all this stuff with them. And he basically like made me the pilot that I am today, I feel like. He was a really good pilot, but he's really strict. He'd like throw things at me and oh, yell wow. at me and stuff. But he said, Bill, you know, I'm going to make it really hard for you on all these flights, and then your check ride is going to be easy. You'll ne you're going to do everything wrong with me. So when you go fly with somebody else, you'll be like, this is the easiest flight in the world. And that's going to set you up for your life. And I said, okay. And so I just went with it. And he's right. Like my check ride was the easiest flight I ever had. But I remember him telling me when I was just getting in the airplane, he goes, you sound like a total loser. Wow. It's like you, you need, if you're going to be a pilot, you got to be cool. It's like pilots pick up chicks. It's a really cool job. You need to sound cooler on the radio, so go work on that. And I was like, I don't even know what this, that means. You just are at home practicing, trying yeah. to sound cool. I mean, I, was, I just came out of Georgia Tech. I was an engineer. I had a mechanical engineering undergrad degree, and then I went to grad school for the, with the military at the Air Force Institute of Technology, got a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. Uh, so he's right. I was a big nerd. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, the stuff you guys are learning, like, you kind of leans toward nerdery the more than it does, like, sexy, cool guys. Well, some, some of us, I think. Like, the, the engineers, those kind of technical people. But there's all kind. There's a huge, wide background of pilots. Like, you don't need to have a technical degree to go be a pilot. Now, a test pilot, I would agree, they're pretty much all dorks and nerds. Oh. Uh, we need a lot of high-level mathematics and science to get in there. But um, it was it was funny, and... and I never even thought about it, and then I remember getting to my fleet squadron in the helicopter, and that guy I was telling you about who was a test pilot, his radio voice was like, I was like, dang. Magical? It's totally different than what his, like, in-person voice was. Oh, so he, he kind of put on a little character. A little bit, I guess. He got, like, when he stepped in that cockpit, he was like, he was, you know, Joe Amaral. Like, yeah. it, was, it was his persona. So, I noticed that, and he kind of like... He would, like, talk outside of his mouth kind of weird like oh, this. Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't every, anything that I, I duplicated, but I noticed the same thing. I was like, wow, that sound like, kind of different on the radio. But it is a skill that you have to learn, not necessarily like, how, to, like, how to talk on the radio. It's really hard. There's all kinds of abbreviations and random stuff. Like, most people that fly with me are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, you just say Charlie Alpha, and I feel like you kind of nail it. You know? Yeah, that's right. That's right. 955 nine, nine, seven, five, Charlie Alpha. That'll do it. Okay, so... I have a lot of debt, obviously. I, I own, like, I'm a partner in, like, 1,500 apartment buildings. I, I built 2,000 storage units down in Orlando. It was a $40 million project. Ooh. I have uh, my house that I use, like, a HELOC on. I pay cash for it, then I put a HELOC on it so I can borrow against to, to leverage to do, you know, all kinds of arbitrage and things. So I use debt. I don't, I don't have any real consumer debt, although we could argue that, I have a car loan on one of the cars so that I would I could use that cash in some of the apartments in real estate that I do to make a, a Delta because it's a 2% loan. And uh, so I, I look at it as like good debt and bad debt. So bad debt being a lot of consumer loans. I would, I would agree that car loans and, and things like that are definitely problematic for everyone on the planet. But I look at good debt. I teach a lot of like raising capital and, and, and using the bank loans and private money and all that stuff for debt on real estate, that cash flows, 
what is your guys' take on that? It's just like all debt is bad, like or don't do all debt for the people that you teach. And tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, this stems from Dave going bankrupt, of course, in the 80s. He had a $4 million real estate portfolio. The bank calls the notes, sees this young guy out here with all this debt and goes, eh, we're going to limit this relationship, uh, which is banker talk for screw up his life. And so obviously Dave's story is so steeped in pain when it comes to debt and the way the lenders treated him, the credit card companies treated him. He said no more. And so then he looked at biblical principles, uh, you know, Proverbs 22, 7, the borrower is slave to the lender. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And so as he climbed out of bankruptcy and, and, you know, met Jesus, it was sort of this realization that the Bible has a lot to say about money, and we look to it for so many other areas of wisdom. Why not look to it for money? And nowhere could he find where debt was looked on as a good thing. And so, truthfully, at Ramsey, we don't see any debt as good debt. And while people, you know, like yourself, have done very well and have not been sort of bitten by the snake, we found that it creates a more peaceful life and you can build wealth without it. And that's what Dave has done. He's got, you know, a $600 million real estate portfolio that's totally paid for in cash that, you know, and you can't mathematically argue that it doesn't cash flow better when it doesn't have debt attached to it. And so... That's the principle, and it's one that I believe because I've experienced a, t- a taste of that, obviously, with much less wealth. Um, but, you know, we have a paid-for house, and I, I don't wish to get another mortgage. I don't want to get a HELOC. I like the way I'm living. And while I may not have a huge real estate portfolio, I'm happy with my life. And so I think there's there's room for all of us here, and there's people who will follow your way and do very well with it. And there's also people who will call the Ramsey Show and be like, I'm screwed. I thought this was going to be a good real estate deal. We're up to our eyeballs in debt. And it just adds more risk and stress to people's lives in the end. Yeah, I almost feel like, uh, so I love what you guys do, especially for the, the entry-level consumer. So somebody who has been in consumer debt, doesn't understand money, doesn't understand how to manage it, how to run it, all those things. And I feel like there's a a part, and I don't know if you guys ever graduate people out of the program and say, okay, I feel like you got a point. I feel like there's a point where people go from, all right, I'm kind of stuck here. Like, I want to grow my wealth. I want to grow my net worth. I don't want to wait 20, 30 years, 40 years to get there. But I, I believe in this principle. So w- when I think about it, you just said, like, I think there's room for both of us. That's kind of where I sit is, like, on the edge of the coin of, like, I love that you got like undergraduate and graduate information here, but let me show you like the, maybe like the PhD of if you do want to grow faster and you're comfortable with a little bit of this kind of good leverage, let me show you what's a possibility here. And I definitely don't force people. I don't say like you have to have debt, like leverage the banks as hard as you can. Like don't sleep at night. Like if it's uncomfortable for people, it's like, well, let's find a comfortable place. Because what I, what I felt was if I did everything in cash all the time, it's just going to take me so long to get there. He would move at a slower pace, Absolutely. but with less risk. And so that's Dave's whole thing of like, he's, just, he's happy to grow slow. He's been at it for 30 years. Now, he could have tried to grow this business and leverage all this debt and done it in 10, but at that point, he could have also tanked the business. And so he found that there's a higher success rate when you do things with cash. And we find this with business owners. Business owners that run their business with cash have less risk of tanking the business. And the business owners that leverage all this debt and then the business fails, well, it's not like they forgive the debt just because your business didn't go well. And the same thing happens uh, across the board with debt. And so people are very starry-eyed when it comes to how much they can make, and they sort of their risk meter is broken, in a sense, when it comes to the risk that they're taking on with all of this debt. And so, you know, Dave has done it his way with cash. We've seen Baby Steps Millionaires do it with cash. We just did a Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour on the Ramsey Show yesterday with Dave. And... We found that most people are building, you know, nest eggs and, and net worths of anywhere from one to six million dollars, and that's without leveraging any debt. And then to become a decamillionaire, which is kind of what you're talking about, how do I build exponential wealth? How do I go to ten million, twenty million, thirty million? Well, that's where entrepreneurship comes in. You're not going to get thirty million from your 401k. And so business, owning a business, being an entrepreneur, even getting into real estate, you can build a sizable net worth of 10, 20, 30 million or even more. And even doing that, you don't have to leverage debt. And there's plenty of business owners out there uh, with our brand Entree Leadership that I meet all the time. And they're running very successful businesses doing 10, $100 million a year 
without any debt on the business. And they they will speak to the fact that it's a much more peaceful way to run a business. And they're able to do things that other businesses couldn't do because they're over leveraged. Yeah, I definitely love the bootstrapping business model of entrepreneurship. It's starting, starting and, and grow, I, I call it growing responsibly. Like how can you grow responsibly? And I feel like that's, that's where I lean on the debt piece for good debt for real estate deals. I've seen a lot of my students and members just over leverage, they over raise, they, they don't manage the money properly, they have bank debt, they have unsecured loans from private investors, and next thing you know, they don't even know how much equity they have in their business oh. because they're not tracking it. And so I, I feel like the people that really can get in trouble are the ones that get way ahead of their skis. They're like, fast, 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 fast. I've got to be making money, I, I'll clean it I up. I found there's not really an underlying purpose sometimes behind some of these uh, folks trying to build wealth out there. It just becomes, well, what's the next deal? What's the next million? What's the next two million? Without really having a, a deeper meaning behind it all, that becomes this endless chase. And they sort of wake up one day kind of miserable. And that's not to say rich people are miserable, but I found that when, whenever there's not a deep why behind it of the legacy, what you're trying to build, what you actually want to do, it just becomes this endless chase of more. Yeah, you're, you're exactly never, you're right. never content. You know, it's always like, well, I got two million, but my buddy has four million. How do I get to that level? And I've met with some of these financial, you know, YouTubers and influencers, and there's a sadness to it all because they sort of don't really have a piece about it. They're discontent with their life constantly, and they look at me and they go, "Why are you so at peace? You only have a million dollar net worth." I'm like, "I'm happy. I know what I'm about. I know I know what I'm for. I got my family. I got I got a great job." I'm okay moving more slowly. Uh, and, and I think that's the, the real like underlying thing here. I love what I do. You love what you do. And we, I think at some point in business and in life, you get to a point where you can have a conversation about your beliefs because you believe them so strongly. Yes. And that's where I think success is. In my journey of real estate, like in the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing. I was listening to my mentor, my coaches. I just did whatever they said to do because they had the success that I wanted. And then over time, I built so much experience that I finally had an opinion. And I think most people today, they're online with an opinion that they haven't earned. Oh, yeah. Anytime you see these like super young guys who think they've figured it all out and they're, they're calling us idiots or whatever, I'm just like, dude, you haven't, even, you haven't even had a full-time job yet. Like You're just out of high school or college, and the, there's a sort of arrogance about it. And I think those are the people who are going to lose their shirt on the next investment trend that they're trying to get their buddies in on. And so that's the part that frustrates me is just the kind of hope stealers and the people who are dogging a proven plan all to sell their own thing. Yep, I Using totally, us as a punching bag. Totally agree. And I think the happiness is in, in the, the kind of knowing the direction that you want to go. And maybe it's just for the next couple of years and things change over time. Um, okay. Dave has built, I live in Spring Hill, Tennessee, just outside of the Ramsey headquarters. And I drive by it. Yeah, semi-frequently. Was that really built with cash? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are, a lot of people have their conspiracy theories. Yeah. That Dave secretly takes on a bunch of debt. But we truly moved at the speed of cash. We were in our old Financial Peace Plaza building. Yeah, up that, in uh, Cool Springs? Yes. Yeah. And so Dave ended up buying that. It, they, were, they were renting it for a long time. They had an option to buy, and he executed on that deal. It was, a, it was a killer deal they ended up getting on it for what it was actually worth. And so he still owns that. And then on top of that, we saved up cash like old school saved up cash in the bank account from the revenue from the profits of the company over time to start on this new project so they bought the land years ago over in berry farms before it popped off and then over time they started breaking ground on the first building and the first tower and now we have a, a second tower and now we have a brand new event center and it was all done at the speed of cash and so i think that whole you know complex is probably worth 250 million dollars at this point and so it's pretty impressive but we truly don't have any credit cards in the ramsey building we we have business debit cards that the whole company is run off we use petty cash for trips and so we really do practice what we preach uh, i know you, we talked offline about integrity yeah. dave is all about integrity and the last thing he wants is for us to look like hypocrites and while he believes it, he also, we don't want to hire people who don't believe in these principles because they go, wait, you work for that Dave Ramsey guy and you use a credit card? You have a car loan? I yeah. knew he was full of it. And our mission and our message is too important to, to be hurt and to lose trust with our fans and consumers because we don't actually follow the principles. So 
I don't follow them to be a parrot of Dave. I follow them because I believe in them. Yep. And that's the thing that people get twisted when it comes to Ramsey, you know, team members. What is something that I haven't asked you that you, that I should have asked you? Oh, that's a great question. Putting it on me to be the interviewer. That's right. What is a brilliant you question You do great interviews, so. Me? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. I think when it comes, I mean, we can talk about what it, what it takes to get your first million as a normal person, you know, as a W-2 employee. I think that's interesting. Cause yeah, what's that? That's well, great. a lot of people look at, you know, entrepreneurship is the way. I don't think everyone is cut for entrepreneurship. Some people are just, it's not, they're not wired for it, and there's nothing wrong with working for someone else. Now, your ceiling of what you could make is limited, of course. You're not going to build a $30 million portfolio with a W-2, a W-2 employee. But for me, it in 10 years, my story was getting out of the consumer debt took about two years, 18 months to get out of that 40 grand in debt. Building the emergency fund was another six months. And then getting a down payment took another few years. And then I was able to get that house and pay it off. And so that's that was really a huge part of my net worth and still is, thanks to home appreciation. The rest was just consistently investing in retirement plans, my wife and I, in our 401ks, 15% until we got the house paid off. And over time, you just look up and go, oh my gosh, you have a million dollar net worth. And so it was a cool milestone, but again, doesn't change your life drastically. Yeah, so slow and steady. Do the right things. Uh, appreciation in real estate, obviously you believe in that. It's there. Uh, some of your biggest net worth is in your house. And just be patient. And then, and also track it. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is people don't track it. And I, I used to track it every single month. Really? Every month. I had an Excel spreadsheet. I was tracking my net worth every month. So I know that all the decisions that I was making was increasing or decreasing my net worth. Wow. So those real estate investments that I started making, I started seeing it because the stock market just wasn't, wasn't getting me there. And that's how I found real estate. Uh, you know, I go to Church of the City in Franklin. Oh, yeah. And uh, absolutely love it. Been going there for eight years since we moved here. And uh, we paid off our debt as a church, and Dave Ramsey came and cut up the check that with, was a, fun. Uh, with like a chainsaw. It was cool. It was the first time I'd ever seen him there on stage, and it was really, uh, really incredible experience. So I'm thankful for uh, what you guys do. I think it's huge for uh, the people out there, and um, I'm definitely, I definitely don't believe, like subscribe to every principle, but everything that we talked about, today, I can 100% see is true and, and actually is is happening out, out in the world. And the biggest thing that I think I took away is like the feeling of me t potentially being part of the problem there for uh, the credit cards. Like oh, me, yeah. me basically trading, I'm, I'm making money off the lower and middle class and I don't like that. So well, read, read the book, see what you think of it. I will, for sure. I got to do a couple checklists here. So, um, all right, you're going to land, so okay. don't forget about that. Okay, so I pretty much got the airplane trimmed up. We're a little bit high, but uh, you can you can fly. You can uh, work the controls. Just, like, small changes. I'll control the power. I'm trying to get you set up a little better. Uh, Y'all damper's coming off. So there's a little bit of crosswind from right to left. So what you want to do is just kind of, like, point the nose at the numbers there, that number six. So it's uh, runway six is heading uh, zero, 060. Zero. We're a little high. i got to correct you a little bit. There we go. That feels better. And you're going to have to kind of manhandle the plane a little bit. So don't be scared to kind of move it around. What we're going to do is hold the nose at the runway. I'm going to put in a little bit of left rudder to get us on center line. So feel that right there. Just kind of hold the nose right there. And this thing's going to want to kind of push us around a little bit. And then as we get our nose over the numbers, we're just going to kind of level the airplane. So pull back a little bit right there. Right there. Hold it right there. And it'll, yeah, just hold it right there. Pull back, pull back. Air a little speed. bit right there. Hold, hold that right there. Wow. <laughs> That was incredible. A little bit firm. That was like a carrier landing. We did yeah. a we did a little bit of a nice modified carrier landing. All right. Hey, I, fun, man. I enjoyed that. What'd you think? I loved it. Thanks yeah? for the experience. I mean, I feel like I got more benefit out of than you did just getting to ride in a cockpit. That's a first for me. Well, the goal is to bring people in here, have an awesome interview, kind of like a podcast, just regular discussion, and let them experience. I love seeing other people experience what I love through their eyes for the first time. Oh, yeah. Because it gets old. Like, you fly every day. It's like, oh, I'm going to fly today. I Someone fly by myself. never seen it, it's just like magic. Okay, how can people find out more information about you? Where should they go? How can they get the book? Where should they go to learn more about you and everything that you guys are doing? At George Camel and RamseySolutions.com. Check out the book, Breaking Free from Broke.